on time. There is an empty chair next to me, and that's for Vince Cerf, who is here and we believe coming. But uh, in respect to you all, uh, I thought we should begin on time, and hopefully this won't involve too much going backwards and, uh, and forwards. Um, let me, uh, first of all, welcome you to this, uh, this, this panel on, on fragmentation and perhaps give you just a little bit of the, uh, the background of some of the work that uh, we have been doing. When I say we, I'm talking about the Center for International Governance Innovation, the only center, the only think tank in my understanding, in my, in my belief, that is focused on international governance innovation in a variety of sectors. So, um, thank you. Uh, so, uh, we started this project uh, which has led to the creation of the Global Commission on Internet Governance, which is chaired by my colleague, um, the Foreign Minister of, of Sweden, previous Prime Minister, Carl Bildt. Um, and uh, we are going to be having a meeting of the Commission uh, in Seoul, Korea, uh, in uh, about five weeks, six weeks' time. Uh, and the main subject, the commissioners have already met once, the main subject they wanted to discuss at this meeting is, uh, is that of fragmentation. So um, uh, it's interesting to me, it's very interesting that that is where they really wanted to start. Um, there was considerable concern around the table and there are several members of the commission uh, that are here. Um, there are uh, members also of the uh, of the research network that uh, has been uh, has been created here. So what we hope we could do is uh, both to have an interesting discussion of fragmentation, but look at how this could feed into um, uh, the work that the uh, that the commission is doing. So there will be a, a follow up uh, to this. Uh, I want to emphasize that this, the work that we are doing on this commission uh, has had a, a considerable degree of involvement from uh, the OECD, and Andy is sitting down to my right, and we are also partners uh, with Chatham House, and uh, that's you know, obviously a wonderful uh, partnership uh, for us. Uh, but we really are in many ways in this commission at the, at the beginning stages. So what I'd like to do uh, to begin, um, and my intent had been to lead off with uh, Vint for uh, obvious reasons, since he was there at the creation uh, of the first linking of, uh, of computers online, uh, to get his thoughts about uh, what the risks and the costs of fragmentation are. But we'll hope that he comes in, and if he does, we'll, we'll make a, a turn in the road to go back to pick up his views. But I'm going to ask uh, Laura Denardis, who is uh, the head of uh, the uh, research uh, part of the, uh, of, of the commission, which is the critical part, um, to uh, say a few words. Here is Vint. Um, uh, to say a few words uh, to begin, and we'll let uh, Vint uh, catch, his, uh, catch his breath. So, <laughs> all right, so Laura, um, uh, give us your view in, in, in five minutes or so, and we're going to try to keep the, the intervention short, uh, as to what we're really talking about when we're, when we're talking about uh, uh, fragmentation. I mean, how do, you, how do you see fragmentation? And then, uh, Vint, when you've caught your breath, I'm going to ask Thank you the you same question. That. All right. So, Laura. Thank you very much, Gordon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to be on this panel with everyone. And uh, you know, I, a, a statement such as, I'm concerned about internet fragmentation, really contains a lot of inherent assumptions in it. It starts by say, assuming that we have a universal internet now. It assumes, in, to some extent, that fragmentation is one thing with a concrete definition. It can assume um, that it's something problematic or something concrete. Um, so I think some people would argue um, that we don't have a universal internet now. I wouldn't argue that, but I understand that because there are different, uh, whether you approach the internet from one language or access speed or particular environment that has different levels of filtering and blocking, or depending on our mediating device, we have a very different experience of the internet. But uh, you know, just putting my engineering hat on, you know, at the level of uh, technical architecture, we have 
certain things, like common protocols, we have a common namespace, we have basic interoperability, we have an end-to-end -end architectural principle. And these qualities have really created the potential for anyone to access or provision content, or for uh, regardless of where you are located or the content is located. And uh, these technical features have also provided innovators with uh, an opening to create products and services, so or conduct commerce, uh, or citizens to interject ideas. So that I do think we have the potential for universality at the level of technical architecture now. Now, of course, there's no guarantee that any individual innovator will succeed or speaker will be heard, but the basic design has created this potential. National borders are completely irrelevant to this design, and that's a good thing. The architecture recognizes boundaries between networks rather than borders between countries, and this has also contributed to the universality. Now, on the second question of is fragmentation inherently bad, that, of course, requires a lot of qualification and a definition of what we mean. What on earth are we talking about here? Now, if you're responsible for network security in some industries, as I know some of you are, you want to design in some fragmentation in certain cases. Some sectors require um, divisions, uh, but these are instances where a choice is made by the end user, and that's fine. Sometimes fragmentation is also synonymous with the issue of localization. And sometimes even, I would assert that even sometimes localization is positive. If we think about having internet exchange points localized in more countries, that's beneficial for technical efficiency and economic efficiency and access to knowledge or, or even content distribution networks. But again, these things, these are things that distribute networks closer to users. They're not things that hold captive data close to users. Other types of localization do hold things captive, like politically motivated requirements uh, for data localization. So these are about content control, and they can have negative effects, um, which I'm sure we'll talk about on this panel. Now, I just want to mention a few other points. One is that um, you know, other types of fragmentation, I, I would suggest, have to, not to do with content as much as with infrastructure design and interoperability. We've had, um, in my opinion, threats to the universality of the domain name system, especially around um, efforts to have stronger intellectual property rights enforcement through the DNS. Uh, we've had some business models that are based on lack of interoperability, including app-mediated platforms, uh, you know, some types of, of models online. And I would even suggest that we are starting to have some trends away from open protocols. Now, for someone like me who grew up in the environment of uh, system, S IBM, SNA, and DECnet, and you know, we just couldn't communicate with each other if we worked in different companies. And moving from that to TCP IP has been a major uh, development in the last 30 years. Uh, a lot of people, uh, I have to tell my students about the proprietary online systems of the 1990s. Um, we don't want to go back to that. So I would also suggest that, um, you know, we have to watch out for the protocol. So that's my two, two cents there, uh, Gordon. Uh, you know, to me it all comes down to a question of, of economic and expressive liberty. Do we have a choice to connect to anyone we want? Can we access the content that we want within the bounds of law from any device? And can we innovate on top of, in, of existing infrastructure? If the answer is yes, we have a degree of universality. If the answer is no, we're moving toward fragmentation. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, as I mentioned, Vid, before you, before you came in, the Global Commission on Internet Governance, of which you're aware, I know, uh, has chosen the issue of fragmentation as, the, as to uh, be the, the key point of the, the next meeting of the Commission, which will take place in Seoul in the, in the middle of uh, uh, October. Um, uh, so give us your views. You, you talked about this issue uh, yesterday morning, I know, uh, in the first session, uh, but give us, uh, give us your thoughts, please. First of all, thank you. I apologize for being late. It's called running back and forth uh, from the hotel to here. Let me start out by reminding you of something. Uh, in the uh, original ARPANET design, our whole purpose was to get everything to connect to everything else. Every computer was supposed to be able to communicate with every other computer. The internet design had the same objective. The theory was that you should be able to send traffic to any termination on the internet. The theory also was that if you didn't want to talk to the other guy, you could throw the traffic away. 
we made an assumption in the early stages that it was possible for the recipient of traffic that they didn't want to, in fact, receive it and discard it. This implied that there was some ability to authenticate the other party who was communicating with you to decide whether you wanted to speak with it or not. As the network entered into commercial use and enterprises became, became part of the landscape, they were not necessarily eager to have every single computer on, in their um, operation defend itself. And so they came up with the idea of a perimeter defense, the firewall. This is a weak substitute for end-to-end -end, uh, defense because it's possible to literally walk around the firewall with an infected uh, you know, uh, memory stick or something. But nonetheless, this was adopted as a common practice. It was not part of the original architecture. Uh, so we have actually found ourselves needing to defend ourselves against communication that we don't want. And a number of ways have been introduced to do that, filtering being one of them, firewalls being another, end-to-end uh, -end cryptography, where if the other side doesn't authenticate, then uh, you can refuse to communicate. But f fragmentation for me starts out being an inability to give myself the option of communicating with anything that I wish to and the other guy the freedom to say no. Then the question is, are the intervening parties between these two potential communicators uh, delegated the responsibility and authority to filter for you? Now, you might have chosen that your company or your ISP will do some of this filtering for you. Example, you get uh, email service from someone, you don't want the spam, someone else is filtering it for you. That, if that's your choice, and if you have the choice of who will do that, I still consider that not to be a bad problem. That's not fragmentation in its worst sense. That's, that's a, um, a, de a decision that you get to make. So the user got to choose whether or not there was some filtering and some uh, diversion of traffic. The same is true for denial of service attacks. If you don't want to or don't have the capacity to defend yourself and you wish to be protected from denial of service, then you might turn to enterprise, you might turn to uh, an ISP to defend you uh, from that. That's not fragmentation. What is fragmentation, from my point of view, is the denial of your ability to choose whether or not there is intervention in your clear channel access to any other party uh, on the network. It gets more complicated when national means are used without necessarily your uh, agreement to filter and isolate you from sources of traffic or sinks of, of traffic that you wanted to get to. At this point now, we get, let me call it, a political fragmentation of the network. This, generally speaking, doesn't help people because if the utility of the network was to assume that if you had an IP address, you should be able to communicate with anyone if they are willing to communicate with you, if that assumption is broken, then all kinds of things don't work that otherwise would work in a very casual way. And as the Internet of Things enters into this architecture, and as, as it is desirable to be able to talk to these devices, either locally or remotely, this arbitrary fragmentation is not going to help. If you have a house full of equipment that you want to manage, and you have the means to validate yourself to your equipment at home, you should be able to communicate. But if there are intervening parties who choose to inhibit your ability to do that, I consider that to be pernicious fragmentation. Last point is that the reasons for intervening and inhibiting communication can range from network management to protect the network resources to purely political motivations to inhibit the ability and freedom of people to communicate with each other. And it's the pernicious kinds of fragmentation that I worry about most. Thank, thank you very much, Vint. Uh, let me now turn to the other members of the panel, and I'll start on my far right with uh, Andy. Andy Wetkoff. Thank you, Gordon. And um, 
I thank all of you for coming here. Actually, you're part of the experiment, I think. Uh, a lot of this is evolving very quickly, ill-defined as Laura suggested. Uh, our interest at the OECD is more of an economic one naturally. We see the internet as a huge source of growth and innovation. And so anything that gets in the way of that working uh, concerns us. Uh, I have some sympathy with some who say that maybe fragmentation is inevitable and is the maturing of the internet and we should be working on adaptation mechanisms. Uh, and as Vint just said, some of this is by design, uh, either by policy objective or by user choice. So it's not necessarily uh, bad. But I, I have a strong interest in having you help me try to frame what is a broad overview of this. Uh, so I want to do so because I want to separate kind of the wheat from the chaff, uh, both uh, currently and potentially in the future. What is fundamental here and expensive and would be a real spanner in the works versus what is uh, nice to have and uh, maybe tolerable. Um, and of course, we'd like to quantify it. Now, this seems like an impossible task, but I would ar argue that it's incredibly important to try to do so for a variety of reasons. One, it provides you with the weights I was just suggesting that you need to figure out what's important and crucial. And the other is, it provides an evidence base so you can diffuse some of the politics and potentially special, special in interests here. Uh, Laura has um, alluded to uh, some of the various uh, aspects of fry fragmentation. What comes to my mind is, is a bit of a, a, a matrix. On, on one dimension, you have these drivers, some of which are public policy objectives, such as sovereignty concerns or, or economic concerns or human rights and fundamental values or preserving local values as subsets of policy concerns. Others are side effects of trying to implement well-intended public policies into code that may fall short. And that's where she was referring to uh, interventions at the infrastructure or logical layer, at the services layer, or even targeting and, and users, all of which probably aren't perfect. But she also pointed to another concern we have, which is the private sector conduct itself, uh, issues of traffic prioritization, walled gardens, uh, protocols, uh, and we've been rallying for 30 years against uh, monopolies uh, in this area, some of which still uh, exist. I like to map that against users. And to date, most of the economic research I've seen has been looking just at the IT sector itself. That will appeal to many in the room. That makes sense. But to me, that's the small cost, potentially. The bigger cost is around IT using sectors, which are huge now. The whole economy runs on this. I just think about the banking sector. And if we get fragmentation uh, through data localization or other means, uh, I don't know how fraud detection techniques as currently deployed are going to work in that sector, just to raise one example. And I break it down, and I'm almost done, between multinationals, which are inherently using these global networks, and will obviously be affected. But what worries me more are the SMEs, uh, who, uh, to some extent, if you fragment this, it may lock in the large incumbents, because the SMEs won't be able to grow and to get the economies of scale that would provide them with the resources to deploy uh, multiple uh, redundancies around the globe, which is what some of this fragmentation would entail. Let me end there. Thank you very much, Andy. Let me turn next to uh, Bertrand de La Chapelle. Thank you. You Thank have you to Gordon. turn this. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, I'm Bertrand de La Chapelle. I'm the director of the Internet and Jurisdiction Project. Um, I want to make a few quick points. The first one is. When you look at the way the internet was built, as Vint explained, it started with the assumption that it was intended to become a global, unified, or fully interoperable system that was a-territorial, I mean, not based on territorial distinction. This is the reason why most of the governance 
tools, our institutions and the ecosystem that we have are global institutions or regionalized institutions but with patterns. If you look for instance at Center as a, as a coalition of CCTLDs, it groups CCTLDs that are not only in the European region, they can be somewhere else because they like better to be connected to Center. This architecture was an architecture of decision making that was on the basis of domain names, addresses, and so on, that were not territorial by principle. When we talk about fragmentation, we seem to tend to forget, because of a short period of illusion, that the reality of the legal environment is a reality of fragmentation. That is the fundamental basis of the international system, is a fragmented legal system. It's called, uh, if I remember correctly, the nation state. And the system of the nation state, which fortunately has many benefits, is the separation of legal system and sovereignties. And the international system is based on non-interference with the affairs of others, which basically is my law in my country and my territory and my geographic criteria, your law in your territory and your geographic criteria. So when we talk about fragmentation, we need to understand that it is the reverse problem than the situation we are on the technical layer. The technical layer has been conceived as global and has to cope with some technicalities like putting cables in some places or routers in others. But the legal system is the reverse. And the second point I want to make is, when I was speaking about an illusion, I think Laura alluded to that a little bit. There are two words about, uh, or two interpretations about fragmentation that come to mind. Uh, the first one is, this is awful because we had this nice unified legal system that was like the technical infrastructure and and when you scratch, the unified structure was on a fundamental principle, which is the law of the country of incorporation of the platforms applies worldwide. Which in many cases, the fact is, through the terms of service and other things, was the jurisdiction of the United States for the major platforms. But it could be the jurisdiction of other countries. So we have to be careful that the idealist model that we have in mind of this unified legal environment is actually problematic in some aspects because it produces effects of extraterritorial application of national sovereignties on the basis of the location of the operators. And then you can try to cope and bring other criteria. Oh yeah, but the location of servers matters. Ah, uh, well, not so much. And, and then you get into trouble. But the symmetry is equally interesting. You have a certain approach to fragmentation that says, this is sad, but fragmentation is the cost of being able to exercise sovereignty. And this is a trend that we've seen relatively recently because of the first element I was mentioning and about because of a certain number of events that happened last year and the revelations of the Snowden and so on. The reaction was a reaffirmation of sovereignty and a desire to re-territorialize in a certain way, and data localization is one dimension of this, of this effort. Those are the two facets, and I think we need to be aware that the two ways of understanding should not be pushed too much. What we want to preserve is the capacity to go from one place to the other. That doesn't mean we should have one single legal framework. And exercising sovereignty in shared online spaces does not mean and should not mean re-establishing very precise borders. Because in many cases, the rules and the responsibilities overlap because the spaces are shared. So the next point, quickly, is when you have the reaction by, and some of you know that, I used to be the, the French representative or the representative in the French uh, Foreign Affairs Ministry. So I've seen this problem from the other side in a certain way than the one I see it now. Exercising sovereignty is legitimate. There is no capacity to, uh, for government to have any role internationally without exercising sovereignty. The problem is that with the internet, the exercise of your sovereignty, if you are not careful, has an impact on other countries. And this is contrary to the principle of sovereignty. 
This is why the Council of Europe in 2011, thanks to the work that was done by a small group of people that I participated in, has adopted two recommendations of its Council of Ministers regarding, in particular, the principle of non-transboundary harm due to national decisions. A state, in the exercise of its sovereignty, has the responsibility to not have a transboundary impact that would be harmful either for the infrastructure or for the citizens of another country. And this restraint is not natural. The natural behavior of sovereignty is not to be restrained, except by wars and conflicts. And so we have the challenge today in civil society, in business, and in governments to understand how the exercise of sovereignty can be legitimate and respectful in an environment where shared responsibilities occur. And here we are confronted with a problem, which is the law of unintended consequences. There are many situations where a very simple, apparently rational decision at the individual level, looks perfectly legitimate, and the cumulative effect of all these decisions is not scalable and is actually harmful for what we want to protect. And I think it can be a, a, a sort of segue to the discussion on data localization, where the rules that apply to access to data can be either scalable positively or non-scalable positively in that regard. But I'll stop there. Thank you, uh, Bertrand. That's very useful, and I hope we'll uh, provoke uh, you in this room and those of you who are uh, listening uh, online uh, to uh, to pose some questions and or to make some observations. But we have one more um, short presentation from the uh, from the panel, and that's from Sunil Abraham. So, Sunil, thank you. Uh, I'll start by examining some of the reasons why there is a renewed interest in fragmentation on the part of uh, the state. And as you said, the state is now back in internet governance. Uh, the first imperative is wanting to exert jurisdiction. Often uh, private actors say, your jurisdiction does not apply, and therefore we will not abide by your law. And the state wants to apply jurisdiction. Second, as in the European Union, some of the fragmentation proposals are supposedly to protect human rights, to protect the privacy of uh, European citizens. The third imperative is taxation. Uh, most of these internet giants are experts at tax minimization, and nation states want to extract tax from these organizations, and according to national tax law, if transactions happen within the jurisdiction, then they're legitimately taxed. The uh, next one is efficiency, and the final one is preferential market access. So what I'm going to do is take some of the most horrible uh, suggestions that states make and try and redeem them and see if we can examine them in more positive light. And I feel if we can address the concerns that states have through technically sound proposals, then they won't take, they won't hopefully make mistakes. So the first horrible idea is the national internet idea. If we were to make it clear to governments that really what you want to protect is military communication and other state communication that deeply implicates national security, then perhaps you should consider a proposal by Gaurav Raj Upadhyay, which says that whenever cable is laid, and since uh, carrying capacity of fiber has increased dramatically because of the improvements in termination devices, uh, maybe some fiber should be allocated or given to the government. So the government on the existing network will have a uh, network that is completely distinct at the physical layer, and uh, they can use that for all the sensitive uh, communications that don't necessarily have to reach uh, the internet. Uh, the uh, s second thing is looking at pre preferential market access. So we've heard stories of the US government uh, banning uh, the purchase of ZTE and Huawei equipment for government agencies. Uh, at one point, the US government actually advised the telcos that you shouldn't be buying 
uh, equipment from both these Chinese manufacturers, but uh, that proposal didn't go through. Uh, Australia, leaked documents tell us that Australia has banned Huawei equipment from being involved in the build-out of the national broadband network. And uh, in some senses, to go to the Indian government and say, don't fragment the internet, you will pay a huge price in terms of GDP, sounds a bit flawed no matter what numbers you throw to them, because the, Ch the Chinese government has, in a sense, fragmented the internet, and there is no perceivable difference to their GDP. They seem to be do doing much better than we are doing. Uh, so we go back to the promise made at WIPO to the developing countries. Sign all these maximalist IP treaties, and we as developed countries will engage in technology transfer. And there is enough literature published which tells us there has hardly been any technology transfer. So uh, threats of uh, fragmentation proposals help with uh, kind of evening the playing field between international players and domestic actors. Uh, threats of uh, fragmentation, even as pure rhetoric, help convince large corporations that they should comply with uh, do domestic law, etc. Finally, uh, if we use the argument that uh, various types of censorship is a form of fragmentation, then the Indian government will say, the US government has already been fragmenting the internet because of their maximalist position on IP. Uh, access to knowledge, in their view, is a precondition to free speech. And if the US government can fragment the government based on intellectual property, then why can't we fragment the internet using repression of political speech or other types of speech? So uh, I'll stop there because I don't want to take too long, but uh, surely legitimate concerns of government can be addressed by people that know how the technology works by providing solutions that won't necessarily break internet protocols, etc., but address their concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sunil. Uh, I hope that has uh, uh, provoked you in the room and those of you who are online to, uh, to, to make some observations and responses to the points that have been made. I'm uh, levitating. You're levitating? Well, then you levitate uh, into the microphone. No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt the rest of your speech. I just wanted to let you know I'm levitating. Thank you. <laughs> no, I do have a few. I have all right. Some, well, why don't you go, go ahead? So, uh, like, look, first of all, please remember that the network is designed and presently operates in a layered way. And so basic connectivity lies at a very you know, low layer, the internet protocol layer. And a lot of the interventions that take place actually occur above that level. And one of the most dangerous forms of fragmentation is to mistakenly intervene at the wrong layer in the architecture to prevent all communication as opposed to trying to inhibit some kind of communication, and that's the intellectual property question. The issue is not blocking the communication channel, it's doing something about access to content that you believe other parties have to show bona fides to get to. Uh, the other point I want to make about uh, jurisdiction is that uh, one of the dangers of all of this is that to assert jurisdictional rights and then to, to extend them in an extraterritorial way uh, is very tempting and it often happens and this is also not entirely acceptable. <laughs> Uh, very calmly put. Um, uh, uh, comments around the table? Uh, I'm just going to ask you to uh, introduce yourselves, which I did, not ver I did very quickly uh, in, at the beginning of this session. Um, who would? Pinder, oh, you're pointing. Okay, yeah, please speak up into the microphone. <laughs> I thought you were number one. <laughs> no, okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ashwin from Indonesia. I think it's. Uh, very interesting, Mr. Finsurf, uh description about the basic philosophy of the internet, at least in the beginning. We can say, I don't want this letter, I don't want this email, I don't want this whatever. I can decide what I want. And even the government can decide what her, she wants, her, the, the government wants in their jurisdiction. 
unfortunately that's not the case today. Now, uh, uh, bearing in mind the development of the internet cases, and if we look at the previous, our previous uh, history, our previous experience about the GPS system, when we built, when the US built their GPS navigation system, it's very useful. It's for global. Everybody can use it. But then, not all group like that. For the sake of security, for the sake of many, many things, they do not want to use the GPS. So the Europe set up the Galileo. The Chinese, first they joined the Galileo, but then they set up their own Baidu navigation system. The Russians set up the GLONASS, and so on and so on. So, a GPS navigation system, a navigation system, the global navigation system, it has been fragmented because we are not, uh, we cannot get an internationalization of navigation system. We don't have multi-stakeholders organization for looking after an operating navigation system. Now, uh, uh, just want to get Mr. Finser's uh, comment. If we cannot do that for navigation system, for the benefit of the whole people in the world, how can we do that in the globalization of internet system? Thank you. Uh, th uh, well, Bertrand, go ahead and uh, ask. I'm sorry, the, I, I didn't hear correctly. You, you were talking about what system, uh, when you said, if we cannot do it for this system, uh, I could not hear exactly what, can you, can you please repeat? GPS, global positioning uh, okay. system. Okay, that, that's what I th thought I heard, but I was not sure, okay. I've seen a hand down here, yes, please. Bill Woodcock, uh, not to be disputatious, and I understand the, the overall point you're making, but I would argue that in, in that example, this is uh, a beneficial redundancy of the kind that Laura was referring to with exchange points, for instance. Um, we now have four systems which are under different control, all of them available to everyone in the world, and you can get a single chip which is a receiver for all four systems and compares the results of them. So if one of the four operators decides to falsify the results, as the US government, for instance, has made clear is their policy position to reserve the right to do, um, you have three checks against that, three other things that will let you know that that has gone wrong. So it, I think we need to be really careful about the, this notion that all all divergences, all changes are fragmentation and are bad, right? I mean, this is something that both Iran and Brazil have been criticized for when they follow the same path that, for instance, the United States and Western Europe have in building out more internet infrastructure. Um, when, you know, we congratulate ourselves for doing it but criticize someone else for doing it, that doesn't seem like fragmentation to me. Um, but. To be clear, there are many other things that are fragmentation and are bad. Uh, yes, I've seen a hand down there. Yes, yes please. Uh, I am Ivan Mendez, an ambassador from ISOC. I have a short question to me, Serf. Uh, who wins with the fragmentation of the internet? What's in it for the one who promotes it? Could you repeat that question? It wasn't really audible. Uh, yeah, the question was, uh, who wins from the internet fragmentation? Wins. Wins. Yeah. Who wins? Yeah, who wins? I mean, uh, there is a fragmentation happening, but who is going to win? Who is winning in this fragmentation? Thank you. Okay. I thought you said Google is the winner. If it's fragmented, they said, no, we're not, you know. Everybody. Okay, so the answer to this question is that parties who do not wish to permit freedom of expression and access to information and sharing of information, those parties win if they succeed in fragmenting the internet in the pernicious way that I mentioned and others have mentioned. And that's not a win for any of us. 
There are parties, of course, who win by preventing people from communicating with each other. That's not a value in my system. Thank, thank please, Petra. Just, just one, one point there. Um, what I was saying regarding the, um, the, the, the model of international arrangements that we have, without being pedantic, uh, it dates back to a situation of huge wars. The 30 years war in Europe were intense bloodshed. And it was solved by this principle of separation, say my territory, your territory, and no overlap. We are now in an environment where this notion, which organizes the physical world pretty well, is in conflict with the way people interact naturally in, in the internet. And so we have two uh, choices that seem to appear as the logical outcome, and none of them are appropriate. One is the complete harmonization at all levels to have the global space, and if we cannot achieve that, the only other solution is to reintroduce separation. I believe that's not the, I mean, it's personal, but I don't believe that's not the way you can, you should ask the question. The real question is, how do we manage the rules for coexistence? We have to find the rules for coexistence, and it's not easy, and as was said before, there was a period where the notion that because a platform was located somewhere, the local laws in another country did not apply, these days are over. They were over back in 1995 with the Yahoo case first, then we got GOIP filtering rules that began to spread everywhere as a solution, whether it's good or not is another debate, but then the notion that local laws do apply to a certain extent, especially in speech-related issues, is now accepted. How it is implemented and to what extent is a completely different problem than how do we repartition. So I think the, the reason why, and I like Sunil's comment that sometimes the fear of something is triggering a good reaction. It is true that the fear that the, the unilateral actions towards something that might be fragmenting is sufficiently worrisome to force people to find the rules of coexistence. But I think that's the right way to ask rather than saying we need to restructure on a territorial basis. Thank you, Bertrand. Before I go to uh, Andy and Sunil who want to comment on this, um, let me just ask uh, Carolyn and Samantha whether there's anybody online looking to ask a question. Uh, we have one question, um, and the question is coming from Casper Bowden, and he's asking, why don't countries sign a new treaty for equal privacy rights and route around U.S. Five Eyes and anyone else who won't? Okay, thank you. Um, let, me, uh, let me now go to the, the, two, the two I mentioned. So, Andy, you can reply to that if you want. And uh, <laughs> I'd rather come back to, uh, will Google be the big winner? And, uh, uh, but, but it's not so much about Google. What I worry about is we really ruin the global network economies here. And it's not so much about Google, it's about the next Google particularly if it comes from more of an emerging economy, is going to face, um, is just not going to be able to scale with the same efficiency that Google was able to scale if these barriers are in place. And to me, it's that, that the unborn that I worry about. Thank you. Let me go next to uh, Sunil and then the gentleman in the blue shirt. Um. We, I just want to examine another proposal by the Indian government. This is by the National Security Council. And the proposal is mandatory routing, mandatory domestic routing of domestic traffic. If we, if we just removed the word mandatory and we just said domestic routing of domestic traffic, that didn't, doesn't sound that bad. And there are two possible ways you can do this and Rudolf Vandenberg uh, pointed out to the difference. One is you can start tampering with routing tables and uh, change the way the internet protocols work. And the other is uh, throw money at the problem and uh, uh, put more fi fiber into the ground and uh, have more active internet ex exchanges. Both measures roughly uh, accomplish the same uh, goal. 
Where I'd like to disagree with Wint is that uh, the authoritarian government really doesn't benefit. Uh, Rohan Samarajiva says that there is a King Gyanendra law. Wherever dictators have tried to censor the internet and do whole scale censorship of the internet, they have uh, usually fallen. Those governments have usually fallen after that. And King Gyanendra is the example from Nepal. There's, of course, a Tan Sen exception which describes the Myanmar situation, but uh, I can't imagine that for an authoritarian government, uh, heavy control and uh, uh, censorship of the internet will actually serve their purpose in the long run. Thank you. Yes, I wonder sometimes how long the long run is, but uh, maybe that's too pessimistic. Gentleman in the blue shirt, did you ask? To, oh, I thought you asked to come no, to participate. This gentleman over here did. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I missed then. He has a blue shirt. Too. Also, I see that. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ankush, and I am the ISOC ambassador from India. Uh, so, we in the panel, we talked about uh, internet fragmentation. It's growing very, growing day by day. Technology is one of the solutions that can help. But what does the panel think? Where, we, where are we going from here now? Are we, are we thinking that technology is the only thing that can help solve this problem? Or there has to be some bodies like IGF, I can, which can help resolve at a global level uh, involving the local governments also? What does the panel think on this? Anybody want to have a crack at that question? Pardon? Okay, yeah. please. I'd like to push back a little bit on a, a meme in the room right now about you know this idea that governments didn't have sovereignty and now they suddenly do. Because I don't think that's right. They, they've had sovereignty, they've had jurisdiction. I think about the things that are, have always already been located within borders. The telecom infrastructures, the IXPs, equipment companies, registries, all of these things completely subject to law. And then even companies who are in another country are subject to the laws in which they uh, do business. So this idea that there was not sovereignty and that there suddenly is, is, um, is not quite right. Um, I, I also wonder why, uh, I, I often receive arguments from other people that governments stepping in are the solution to so many of the problems that exist right now. Because if you just look at the last five years, we, you know, governments, uh, I'll just be a little bit provocative intentionally, don't really have a great track record when it comes to the internet. We have governments cutting off access. We have gov governments, many governments, engaging in surveillance. We have governments engaging in filtering and censoring. So um, in coming directly to the question, I think that a balance of powers is a much better solution than turning to this issue of jurisdiction and uh, government solutions. Um, just one more point to, to heap onto what you said. These are very technically complex systems. We have systems that have hundreds of billions of transactions a day. And moving from an environment where it's, uh, the decisions are based on technical expediency to politically driven decisions, I think, can have unintended consequences. And I don't think we should take for granted the stability that we've had thus far. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Bertrand? First of all, I, I wanted to, to go back to what Laura said at the very beginning. What I liked about her presentation is an attempt for once, which is not that frequent in, in our discussions in general, to introduce nuance. The word fragmentation is extremely loaded, just like was balkanization and so on. And whenever I see, and I owe that to um, um, Art Riley, who used to work at Cisco, in one of the first IGFs, I had a workshop, and he used, uh, it was in Rio, he used a word that says, you need to be careful, people need to have the same vernacular, i.e. you need to make sure that they put the same thing behind the same words, because otherwise there's no way they're going to find a solution to the problem. And so the exercise that we're trying to do here is, behind the word fragmentation, there are many representations, and sometimes very visceral representations. I can give you a very concrete example. I come from France. I, was in the, I worked in the French government in the past. In the military doctrine of the French government, the notion of sanctuarization is an extremely strong um, word. The dissuasion, the uh, nuclear power, is about making a sanctuary of the territory. 
And when I talk with French people, and including in the, in the military sector, and we talk about fragmentation and, and um, balkanization, it does have a bad meaning, but not only a bad meaning, because it also evokes these other words of we are protected. And we have to be very careful because when we talk about that, what is a bad thing for one may feel also as a, a positive thing for others. So the good thing about this discussion is that it tries to single out different elements. The portion that I deal with on a daily basis on, on the issues of jurisdiction are different from the issues that people deal at the technical layer or uh, the ones who multiply, as Bill was mentioning, IXPs and so on. So we need to understand that when we address this thing, and this is an answer to your question, where do we move from there? The first thing, if we could move forward on several tracks rather than on a single track regarding fragmentation, that would be wonderful. What Andy was saying regarding startups, uh, the unborn, is absolutely true, uh, without pushing the reasoning too far. If you launch a startup today, you do have to take into account a much bigger diversity of laws than you had in the past. And Laura, you were right. The laws were always there. But let's be frank, a lot of companies in the early days could get away with answering, we're based in this country, so it's our country law that applies, and not yours. And it took some pressure and it took some um, deliberation to try to find a balance. And we are beginning to find a balance. So finding the different tracks, and I think the, uh, the, the commission and the, and the network has among its benefits to potentially uh, identify those tracks. But moving forward needs to identify where Basically, harmonization is not possible, but interoperability is possible, where some structuring of cyberspace is useful also on a legal basis, where it should not be promoted, etc. Introducing nuance is one of the biggest benefits that the IGF could and the Commission could bring. Uh, thank you very much, Bertrand. Other uh, comments or questions, including online? Yep, there's, there's one down in the back of the room and one to my right. Please. Thank you. My name is Sergio Alves. I am Brazilian. I come from the telecom regulator, uh, but I'm here with ISAC, this uh, DIGF. I wanted to address a question uh, to someone from the US, uh, maybe to Mr. Vince Surfer, to Laura. Um, there are some services, we usually look into international cases and there is, uh, Brazil has been one of the cases, ITU has been one of the cases on fragmentation and this word that uh, Mr. Betran brought on balkanization. Um, in the US, I have looked into the history of this word in the United States and it was firstly used in 1918 and since 1940 it has been used uh, by the US Supreme Court to explain um, some, to address some of the issues of the interstate commerce clause, which basically allows some, some states to, do, to have different jurisdictions within the, in the United States itself. And I would like, and then it has brought some issues to startups and to internet companies there. We have seen Lyft, uh, Uber, Landing Club, um, or several, um, even Tesla, which with um, some legislations being proposed, for example, in North Carolina that would, uh, would not allow uh, Tesla cars to be sold online. Um, I would like to see how you address, how you, how you, how you foresee this, this issue of being, being handled in the United States itself. Some of the companies are allowed to operate in one, in one, side, in one state and they're not allowed to operate in others. It's different from the architectural level that we have touched, but at the service level, um, it's pretty important for to understand how this uh, comes up in the United States as well. Thank you. Why don't I combine two questions here, and then I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the panel to reply to uh, to yours, um, and uh, but then I'll bring in other other uh, other panelists, and uh, we'll we'll aim to wrap up in about uh, five minutes. Uh, the person on the far right side here uh, that indicated they wanted to speak. Well, I thought there was one down there. Please, then you go ahead. No, there was one. The there, I was sure there was one down there. No? Well, it doesn't look like it. I Gone away. It's on the left. Oh, there is a one. Uh, this this uh, lady here, please, yes. 
Hi, Audrey Plunk with Intel. Sorry, I, Bertrand mostly addressed what I was hoping somebody would bring up, which um, seemed like there was a bit of a disconnect between uh, political fragmentation and policies around what equipment can cross borders and you know who wants to buy what from whom versus um, sort of technical fragmentation in terms of whether the infrastructure will interoperate and so I just I was going to see if the panelists would react to those separations but Bertrand sort of already did so I don't want to you know divert attention from other uh, other topics. Thank you. Uh, and there was much nodding of heads to my right, uh, I saw, with your comment. Um, any, uh, anybody else? Yes, this gentleman. Thank you. My name is Yuri Milosevsky. I'm from Russia, from Ministry of Telecom. Um, I really appreciate um, the Mr. Vinsurf's uh, explanation what this fragmentation and what is not. Uh, but I have uh, an example in mind which was not covered. Uh, I always thought that internet was invented to to interconnect the networks. And I think today we have the um, the, the similar situation. Um, probably some applications uh, could be considered as an as uh, networks, uh, like social networks, uh, like um, Skype, FaceTime, the, it's uh, applications with their own stake of protocols over the internet, which they use to interconnect, to, as an in, in interconnection base. Um, some of these applications uh, are localized within states' borders, like the government. Uh, uh, is it fragmentation or not? I think not. Uh, I think we need the, the uh, elaborated definition of what is the fragmentation. I don't know what is it, but what is the, the reasons for real fragmentation, um, it is, I, I think, I suspect, it is the um, lack of, um, of transparency in the administration of critical resources of internet, and uh, lack of uh, lawful regulation and lack of security, of uh, business continuity abilities. So, my proposal is to think about uh, putting uh, in, in, into the definition your, your vice explanation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we have, at least I find up here, I have no idea what's going on up there, but it's producing an enormous amount of noise which, uh, which doesn't make hearing up here any, any easier. What I'll do then uh, now is just uh, giving them uh, each a minute, if I may, um, ask the panelists to, to reply to such questions as they uh, wish to reply to, uh, and make any, uh, any last comments, and I'll start on my left with you, Sunil. Uh, I'll, I'll pass. I don't have any concluding comments. Thank you. Do you know Trump? Oh, well, we're not playing great. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a professor, so I always have other comments all the time. Um, I'll just, I'd like to react to this uh, statement about separating the policy layer from the technical layer because you can't separate the policy layer from the technical layer. It's not that we shouldn't, it's that we can't because technical design can be a form of public policy. We don't have to look any further than accessibility standards for the disabled. You know, they're good, in good ways and bad ways. And, um, and also, the, you know, the basic thesis of my work is that arrangements of technical architecture are also arrangements of power at the same time. That's why it's so important to look at this intersection of what governments are saying that we should do about infrastructure and what we actually do. And, at the, and uh, the converse of that is also true, that decision-making at the policy layer can 
very much affect infrastructure. So I think we have to look at those as being a little bit more connected than we would want them to be. Yeah, I see this gentleman here in the t-shirt or the green, I'm not sure it's green or yellow with my eyes, but anyway, <laughs> it's bright. Um, if I could just ask you to be brief because we're going to otherwise run out of time. Thank you. I'm very, I'm very brief. Uh, Dmitry Kachmanyuk, UACC TLD. Well, just commenting on the technical and policy. Well, there is actually, we do have a problem with the top level uh, domain of UA uh, subdomains not operating in Crimea and some ISPs in Crimea and not being able to operate due to basically some fiscal and political issues. So policy does affect technology and critical resources and I have witnessed that right now. I don't want to go into detail, but you cannot separate these issues unlike the general said. They do impact. It's like if you cannot make a payment for services, you cannot connect to the host country, so you, you have to. So it's like Crimean ISPs are forced to send traffic to Russian ISPs because they have no other choice. Not because the wires aren't there, but because the money cannot be sent. You know? And likewise with domain names. That's pretty much all my comment. Thank you. Thank you. I, Vin, I'm going to save you for the end. Okay. So uh, Bertrand and then Andy. Um, the idea of the definition is what I was alluding to with identification of the different dimensions. I think it's more important than trying to find a definition, but sorting the different dimensions. I want to open the debate on the separation of uh, policy and, uh, and, and technical. It's not, I think, that it's not because there are overlaps that the two cannot be uh, considered as separate entities, but that's a discussion that we've been having with Laura for a while. Uh, to quote Baroness Ritchie, with whom I was discussing yesterday, was the, the chair of Nominet, she was saying that when those things overlap, it's a little bit like when you do cream from milk. You activate the milk, and then at one point it becomes cream, but you don't know when one has gone into the other. Still, there's something called milk and something called cream. So there's something called policy, there's something called technical, and in between there are technical impacts of the policy and policy impacts of the technical, which is what the Net Mondial said. And finally, um, I, I fully uh, agree that actually there are different dimensions for those of you who may have noticed it, this is the second in a uh, workshop in a track of three workshops regarding fragmentation. There was one on uh, Tuesday uh, on the technical dimension led by ISOC. This one has covered, among other things, the, uh, some of the economic dimension and the costs uh, by, by CG. And as the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, we have a third one tomorrow at 2.30 uh, in room two on the legal dimension of jurisdiction and so on. And you're, of course, cordially invited to attend. <laughs> Thank you, Bertrand. Andy? Thank you, Gordon. I, I guess I'm taken by the unintended, uh, uh, unexpected effects of there. And I think the way it was intended was just, you know, you do one thing here and three other things happen that you really didn't know about. And it's what Bertrand's talking about, the interaction of the technical with the regulatory. But I also worry about the unintended effect of creating maybe a political economy where you, you could go in for one objective, which sounds okay on the surface, but then it creates an environment that's right for other mischievous behavior, and you end up with this slippery slope where things get worse and worse. And helping to sort that out would be, um, you know, I, I again welcome the expertise in the room for thinking that whether that's a real concern or maybe something that I don't have to worry about. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. Vint, you get the last word. Thank you. Well, I'll try to keep this short. First of all, there are some kinds of fragmentation that you can't help and you need to overcome and technology will help. One of them, in radio world, for example, you get into radio shadow, uh, other kinds of uh, impairments occur, and there isn't any communication. There are protocols that rec recover from that kind of fragmentation, and that's a good thing. Uh, I think that the problem we run into uh, is this policy and technical uh, interaction. There are some kinds of fragmentation that are abused. Uh, the, the ways of achieving them are abusive. For example, domain seizure to shut down everything at a particular website is a, an, a clumsy way of dealing with a much more refined problem. The technologists may actually have to help the policy guys find less uh, disruptive and less blunt ways to achieve a legitimate objective. 
On the other side, there are times when fragmentation uh, is, uh, is intended to prevent what would otherwise be thought uh, legitimate communication. This is the John Gilmore case. John described that the internet interprets censorship as um, essentially damage and it routes around it. And what you find is when people object to being prevented from communicating, they find technologies to get around that censorship and around that uh, intervention. And we see that all the time, virtual private networks, end-to-end uh, -end cryptography and a bunch of other things. It's a missile, anti-missile kind of scenario and it's going to stay that way for as long as I can imagine. Well, thank you very much, uh, Vint, and thank you all, all the panelists. I would ask you all to give them a hand of applause. I think we've had an interesting discussion. I know, I know we could have gone on for longer. Anyway, thank you all. That's right. Thank you. That's for you. This is great. That's great.